Hi, so today I'm going to take a look at an old forgotten headset that some of you, or most of you maybe, might not know about. In many ways ahead of its time, and in other ways dead in the water on arrival. This headset is the LG 360 VR. Now first of all, the main aspect of this headset that you might find interesting, and that is, I would say, quite ahead of its time, is that this headset actually uses pancake lenses. Now you might know pancake lenses from new generation headsets such as the Quest Pro or the Pico 4. This headset came out in 2016. In 2016 we saw the release of the Rift CV1 and the HTC Vive and this one came about a month or two after both of those headsets. So this headset was released May 10th 2016 and the Rift CV1 for example was released on March and I think the Vive was released in April. Anyway, this headset had pancake lenses roughly seven years ago, <laughs> almost seven years ago now at the, record, at the time of recording this. That I find pretty interesting. Obviously, there's going to be some issues with that. There's a reason why it didn't take off, why it didn't catch on that optical stack at that time and why we stuck with Fresnel for so long and it's only now in the last year or so that we're really starting to see headsets depart from that in any meaningful way. Of course, there's always been you know the odd headset here and there but this one in particular i think is quite interesting it shows off a form factor that we're only starting to see now and with pancake lenses first of all let's talk specs this headset has a 80 degrees horizontal fov it had a 920 by 720 per eye resolution it cost 200 dollars had an lcd panel with rgb stripe and 60 hertz refresh rate it's important to note also that this was an individual panel per eye so not like the quest 2 where it's one panel another notable specification of this headset is the weight it's 143 grams which i believe is lighter than even the big screen beyond now of course this headset is three off it's not six degrees of freedom so unlike big screen beyond where you've got lighthouse tracking you've got full six degrees of freedom this headset is just very much in the vein of the mobile vr that was popular at the time things like gear vr daydream etc so let's uh open it up and take a look So we can see that this is a pretty good example. The box is a wee bit damaged, but overall it's actually untouched. It hasn't been opened or used ever, it appears. So we have this carrying case, which contains the headset itself. Then there's a manual that's just in multiple languages. It's got some neat diagrams near the start here. This looks like a, like an, like a cat from a cartoon, but that's uh, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing's up to you, but um, I'll say it's a good thing. And then what's this warranty? Maybe, um, yeah, warranty. And also, we have the original microfiber cloth still in the packaging. I quite like this. I've actually got a few microfiber cloths that I've collected over the years, like an Oculus one, a Pimax one, some other ones. Which it's a it's a nice little thing to have. A bit of history there. So here it is, the LG 360 VR. So I'll quickly unbox it, show it to you. We'll talk about it a little bit and then I'll explain some of the history of it and my experience with it and where it stands now in 2023. So quite a hefty case to open. <laughs> oh wait, no, no, never mind. You have to press it in. Okay, that's the trick. That's actually quite a clever design. So if I'm trying to just pull it directly, it's quite hard, but if you just press it in, it pops open. Actually quite a nice design that. You got some good foam padding in there. And here is the headset itself. So as you can see, this one is completely unused. The packaging's all intact. Sticker, sticker's still on it. Plastic cover still on the, uh, on the USB cable. Made in Korea, model LG R100. And that was the first and last model, as far as I'm aware. So you can see here, this is absolutely tiny, really, really small. 
for reference, let me grab a Quest 2. So there we have it <laughs> next to the Quest 2. So really, uh, absolutely minute headset. You could probably fit it inside, uh, almost. But yeah, absolutely minute. <laughs> that is hilariously small. I'd love to get a, my hands on a big screen beyond and put these side by side and compare them. I think that could be pretty interesting. This technically is a well put together pancake lens headset from seven years ago, which is just mind blowing to think about. Now, let's make, let's turn this around and take a look at the main aspect. These actually, these have a pretty good click to them. Surprisingly. And yeah, comes with little covers on the lenses. And here are those pancake lenses themselves in all their glory. You can see completely clear. So we should theoretically be enjoying edge to edge clarity with this headset. Although each edge is going to be 80 degrees. <laughs> so the edge to edge aspect of it is uh, still fairly small. Although I will say for the size of these lenses, these lenses are absolutely tiny. For the size of them, I'm pretty surprised that it's actually 80 degrees at all. I would have expected even less. So, you know, there's pretty something good, pretty. So it's impressive what it is. Of course, there's a wee nose rest here. So big screen beyond, for example, it's just the facial interface presses against you. This clearly sits out a bit further. And I recall when I used this, I'll go into that a bit more later. I used this at launch actually briefly. And I remember there's no facial interface really around here. Like, like you see this part here, but it doesn't block light whatsoever. You can see maybe even here that this part of the lens is almost even popping out beyond the, uh, the face gasket and the face gasket is a quite a stiff rubber it's not going to be comfortable but this really isn't meant to press against your face i don't think they were going for full immersion here i think this was more of a media viewer intended device one other aspect of it that even most pancake lens headsets coming out now are missing is diopter adjustment so you can see that these turn now, from my understanding, the way this works is that it's pancake lenses, so there's multiple elements to the lens. And I believe that it's when you're doing this, it's moving one of those elements in and out, kind of like a magnifying glass, how you would move it in and out, and it would change the focal distance of it. Someone in the comments, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my basic understanding of it. So this is diopter adjustment. For those that of you that are not familiar, this allows you to input your own um, prescription so if you have myopia if you wear glasses then you can counteract that by inputting individual prescription per eye and you won't need to wear glasses with it which of course is quite a important factor when you're using this headset as looking at the form factor you are not fitting glasses into this whatsoever even if this nose piece wasn't here which perhaps it's removable i'm not sure i don't want to break it oh it's quite bendy that's good and um, even if you could remove this glasses would your glasses would need to be absolutely tiny to fit in here so and for me personally my head is <laughs> possibly wider than this headset itself i have quite a hefty wide head so um yeah there's absolutely no chance of my glasses fitting in there for actually just for fun this is my glasses in comparison. You can see, yeah, almost wider. <laughs> so trying to fit those in. You know what? It's closer than I would have expected, but of course it's just not going to happen. So you really do need that diopter. And considering the price point that this was coming in at, and considering it was such an early implementation of pancake lenses, I find this actually very impressive. I must say that there was diopter adjustment. Quest Pro, Pico 4, for example, those are mo examples of modern um, pancake headsets, and those are very much missing um, any sort of 
diopter adjustment. Vive Flow has diopter adjustment. Our Para 5K has diopter adjustment. Um, I believe the XR Elite has it. I'm not actually certain, but I'm pretty sure the XR Elite has it also. But yeah, you would just tune in your prescription here. If you have astigmatism, it's not going to account for that, of course. That needs to be more individual. But I think you could probably get enough of the way with just the di diopter adjustment for a good experience. The headset was connected by USB-C. So this was in 2016. So to explain a bit about the platform that this was on, um, this was this icon was the icon for it. The LG G5 was the phone that this was released with. And at the time, LG was kind of taking a, an approach where they were trying a lot of different things. And one of their ideas was to have a modular phone. So this phone, the LG G5, had all these various modules. So one module was for uh, a battery bank with a camera dial control for uh, controlling the focus and the zoom of the camera manually, or maybe just the zoom actually. But um, yeah, there was different, uh, I think, I believe they had an audio upgrade. One was like, I think it was like an improved DAC. And then I believe another one may have had a speaker. This one, was one of the main friends as they call them lg friends i don't believe this was compatible with any other phones these were the entire modular idea that lg was going for which personally i thought was quite a neat idea and pretty um ahead of its time in many ways but it was scrapped it didn't take off and i think that also marked somewhat of a turning point for lg as a company the g2 g3 g4 those phones are very very well ex um well received and the G2 in particular was an exceptional phone for the time and done really well. So I think I wouldn't blame this headset for the downfall of LG, but I think they were trying maybe just throw too many things at the wall at once. What I will say is that this could have been something really special had they stuck with it, maybe met a second generation. I remember trying this at the time. So I went to, I was living in Seoul at the time, so I was able to get trying things like this maybe a bit earlier, or even, I'm not entirely sure if this actually released in other countries outside of Korea. I'm, I'm pretty certain it released in the US, but I'm not sure if it released in Europe or other areas. Um, but yeah, I remember going to a VR cafe. So this was right at the time, the summer of 2016, <laughs> when all these headsets had just been released, the Rift CV1, the HTC Vive. I went to this cafe to try them all out. So at the time I was looking to get a headset. I had been messing around with a DK1 and DK2 for quite some time. And these had just come out. Finances at the time didn't allow me to just outright buy one. So I was saving up a bit, so I decided I'll go to this cafe, I'll try them out, see what the different options are. And there at that VR cafe, they had the CV1, the Rift, the Vive, the Gear VR, I believe, was there also. And then this one, the LG 360 VR. And I remember trying it and it was bad <laughs> there's no two ways about it it was it was a bad experience it was very uncomfortable it had a very very dim display and i believe that is a big part in thanks to the pancake lenses if you're not familiar pancake lenses the light efficiency of them is particularly poor so you can lose up to in some cases 90 percent, i believe um light loss so you really need super bright panels inside and i remember the brightness in this even back then when standards weren't so high and we also in general people weren't you know super familiar with what was going on what was what you know we weren't as particular about specifications and aspects of headsets because it was all still so so new we were a lot more open to um you know poor experiences like high screen door effect and you know relatively low brightness things like that but this even then this was um i remember trying this and moving on from it pretty quickly i really wish i had spent some more time with it even, and today i don't have the g5 unfortunately to test it out so i'm going to take a look i believe someone on github somewhere has a, a repo for where they've managed to get this working as a display over USB-C. So if I can get that working, I'll show some video footage of that and some opinions. But as of right now, I actually have no way to run this or test it. 
I'm pretty certain this one is likely to be working. Oh, also there is a 3.5 mil headphone jack, um, which is an interesting addition, I guess, if you wanted to just have, you know, less wire, but you could have, of course, plugged your headphones into your phone directly, um, which may come as a shock to some people, but they actually had this Wii port in phones back then. <laughs> but yeah, just the size of this, it's so minute. And in so many ways, it was really ahead of its time. It just wasn't a great execution, unfortunately. But it was a very, very interesting glimpse into the future, I do believe. And we've seen now, in 2022, 2023, around this time, we're seeing this future finally come to fruition in some way. So how much of this influenced modern headsets very little, I would imagine, to be totally honest. Um, I don't see much about this that's really... I guess, potentially, this idea of the... Um, of the kind of glasses with the pad on the back. I'm not sure if this was something that was first seen here, but I do know, like, 5 Flow, for example, we see this same form factor. I think um, Shift All's Megan X has a very similar style so it would be very interesting to hear from hardware manufacturers working on small form factor pancake lens headsets now where they actually take an any cues from this at all um maybe they looked at it for some things of what not to do like this this idea of the nose piece and just the kind of putting all the weight directly onto your nose <laughs> even at 143 grams as light as that is you know, I think you're going to struggle to get through a full movie with the entire weight of this resting on your nose. So that would be a very questionable design choice indeed. But I just wanted to show this headset off, you know, and kind of archive it a little bit and maybe answer any questions that people have. Please feel free to answer in the comments uh, or ask. Please feel free to ask questions in the comments. Um, this channel, this is the first video of this format. So what I do hope to do is take some of the headsets that I have right now and archive them, show them off a little bit, talk about them, give some history maybe. And just as a way to kind of appreciate the hardware of the past from VR, where this industry is moving so fast. So the hardware, there's always new and exciting hardware, but it is quite nice to look back at different headsets, particularly ones that are maybe a bit less known or a bit forgotten, or like this one, perhaps a bit ahead of its time in some ways. So this channel will be very casual. It's just me doing these videos whenever I kind of get the urge, but I do want to cover some ones. Like I have a number of headsets here. I have in particular a Meta 2. This is the Meta 2 AR headset from a company called Meta before Facebook became Meta. It's a relatively unknown headset, I would say. Uh, so that one I want to cover. It's very interesting. But I've got a bunch of headsets and I'd also like to cover the story of some that didn't make it to fruition, like the Deca Gear, for example. Um, I was quite active on their Discord back in the day and I, I still think they have my $10 somewhere, but I never asked for it back. It was, uh, <laughs> I, I thought it was just kind of a, a bit of a moonshot and yeah, that one was missed, but I'd like to cover that sometime. So anyway. I'll leave it at that. This video has kind of dwindled on long enough, but uh, I appreciate y'all watching this. And if you have any questions or any suggestions for videos or anything like that, please do let me know. Take care.